Hello again, folks, and welcome to the next lecture. This one is on dysphagia, basic assessment and management and use of flexible endoscopy in dysphagia. And this is chapters 10 and 11 in the Johnson and Jacobson. All right, so first, I'm gonna give a little bit of a review of some key terms. So swallowing is defined as the process of moving food into the body for digestion. Mastication is defined as the process of preparing food for swallowing or chewing and mixing in saliva. Deglutition is the process of swallowing. A feeding disorder is the inability to gain enough nutrition by eating. Dysphagia is an impairment affecting the ability to swallow safely, also known as a swallowing disorder. And a feeding tube is an alternative method of gaining nutrition if you can't safely eat by mouth. That would be PO or per oral consumption. So it's a tube that transports liquid nutrition directly to the stomach. And there's various uh, and sundry types of feeding tubes. Uh, nasogastric tubes, which run from the nose to the stomach. These are typically temporary. And gastronomy or G tubes, which run to the stomach. These are more permanent. And there's also J tubes, digostomy tubes that uh, are also available. A few more terms here. Bolus is food and or drink that someone is trying to manage and swallow. A reflexive cough is a cough that expels food or drink that's entered the, entered the airway. This is a reflex action done to protect the airway. Pocketing or oral stasis is food or drink that is not swallowed and remains in the oral cavity. Penetration is food that enters the laryngeal vestibule but stays above the level of the vocal folds. Aspiration is food or drink that enters the lungs, that is, goes below the level of the vocal folds and interferes with effective breathing and can cause asphyxiation or infection via aspiration pneumonia. And signs and symptoms include coughing, choking, and speaking with a wet or gurgly voice. That can also be a symptom of penetration rather than aspiration. And then there's silent aspiration. And this is aspiration of food or drink that is not accompanied by obvious signs or symptoms. That is, a person can aspirate without a cough. So a review of the various phases of swallowing. First, there's the oral prep phase, which is chewing and prepping the bolus. The oral phase, which is initiation of the swallow by moving the bolus to the back of the mouth to the level of the fascial pillars. There's the pharyngeal phase, in which there is a blocking of access to the airway and secession or stopping of breath. Uh, the bolus is pushed into the esophagus. So the airway closes, the vocal folds, the true vocal folds, the false vocal folds come together, and the uh, epiglottis is inverted. Uh, there's kind of a bottom-up closure to help clear any penetration. So the, false, the, the true vocal folds approximate or come together, the false vocal folds approximate or come together, and then the epiglottis folds over uh, the larynx. Uh, the hyoid is pulled up anteriorly and superiorly by anterior elevator muscles, and this also helps to dilate the upper esophageal sphincter, or the cricopharyngeus muscle. Uh, and then there's, a, there's also pharyngeal stripping action that occurs kind of uh, from superior to inferior that uh, propels the bolus kind of back and downward towards the esophageal opening, the esophagus, the upper esophageal sphincter. And of course, the, the cricopharyngeus or the upper, upper esophageal sphincter opens or dilates, and the bolus enters the esophagus. And then there's the esophageal phase where there is a pushing of the bolus down into the stomach via this peristaltic wave, this peristalsis, the sequential contraction of these esophageal muscles. And also during this phase, the airway reopens and breathing is resumed. Okay, a few videos here. Swallowing occurs in two stages, the oropharyngeal and esophageal stages. At the start of a swallow, a food bolus is voluntarily pressed by the tongue up against the roof of the mouth and backwards towards the pharynx. In response to activation of pharyngeal pressure receptors, the swallowing center in the medulla initiates reflexes that prevent food entry into respiratory passageways. The uvula contracts, which blocks the nasal passages from the pharynx. The laryngeal muscles contract, closing the glottis at the top of the trachea by tightly aligning the vocal folds. The epiglottis swings down upon the closed glottis. With all airways blocked off, respiration is temporarily inhibited. As the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes, pharyngeal contractions drive the bolus into the esophagus. The oral pharyngeal stage is done and breathing resumes. During the esophageal stage, a primary wave of peristalsis initiated by the swallowing center 
pushes the bolus through the esophagus. As the bolus travels through the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes, allowing the food to enter the stomach. If the bolus is sticky and adheres to the esophagus, secondary peristaltic waves triggered by the intrinsic plexus at the point of distension completely clear the esophageal lumen to finish the swallow. The second video here is a little bit longer. It's about nine minutes, so we'll let you play that one at your leisure. And this is a normal swallow. We're looking at a modified barium swallow study. That was a lateral view. Here's an anterior view. And one of the cool things about YouTube is it allows you to replay things at a variety of speeds. So you could actually change the playback speed to a quarter of the original rate. This allows you to see the swallow at one quarter of the original speed. It happens very quickly, despite even being one quarter of the original speed. And this is a video of a fluoroscopic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing or a fees. This is a normal subject. Hi, Addie. I'm Carrie. I'm a speech pathologist. I'm going to be helping out with the evaluation today. We're going to be doing a type of swallowing evaluation where we put a camera in your nose and we give you different consistencies of food items to swallow and to watch you swallow those. This is the camera we're going to use. It goes in your nose about this far, just a little bit past that white line. There's not much space between your nose and your throat, so it doesn't have to go in very far. We're not in there very long, just long enough to take a look around at the anatomy, give you a couple of things to eat and drink, and watch you swallow those, and then we come out, okay? So the different items we're going to be swallowing, we like to do an assortment of consistency. So we do a thin liquid, a puree, and then a solid consistency. I put a little green food coloring in the liquid and the puree. That just allows us to see it better when the camera's in place. Okay. You see? If you want, we can show you it afterwards too. Ready for me? Mm -hmm. Go ahead and take a couple more for me. Your other hand. There you go. Take, go ahead and take a bite of one of those. When you are considering whether or not ha someone has a feeding disorder, you might ask, are they losing weight? Are they not gaining weight? Or if it's a child, are they not, they not growing at a normal rate? Uh, do they have poor appetite? Do they vomit during or after eating? Do they have any food aversions? What are they refusing to eat? And do they have any difficulty getting food or drink into their mouths? So with respect to swallowing disorders, you might ask uh, if it's a, an infant, do they have difficulty nursing or taking a bottle? Um, do they have difficulty keeping food or drink in their mouth? 
Um, do they spend an insufficient or excessive amount of time chewing or manipulating the bolus before swallowing? Do they pocket the food or drink in their oral cavity? Do they cough? Do they choke? Do they have a wet or gurgly voice after swallowing or between bites or sips? Uh, do they have uh, chronic respiratory infections? Uh, what type of food and drink give them trouble? And then looking at dysphagia versus poor dentition. So dysphagia is problems managing food or drink because of poor muscle control for chewing or, and or swallowing. De it can be uh, decreased sensation to detect and manage food and drink appropriately. And it can be uh, poor airway protection. Poor dentition, on the other hand, this is insufficient quality or quantity of teeth. And they might have a problem managing their food because they're able, not able to adequately masticate or chew their food before attempting to swallow. And so this might look like they're spending a long time chewing, uh, increased effort uh, to chew and, and or swallow a bolus that wasn't chewed enough. Um, and it could be coughing or choking as well because perhaps the, uh, the bolus was not adequately chewed. Okay, now switching back to the J&J, &J, we're gonna look at uh, the dysphagic population in acute care settings. So in acute care, they are focused on cost containment. So this manifests as shorter stays for patients. Uh, patients with dysphagia can have a variety of etiologies, such as strokes, especially brainstem strokes, and these might be undiagnosed initially. Um, they can have head injuries, spinal cord injuries, uh, progressive neurologic diseases, such as Parkinson's, motor neuron diseases, MS, Alzheimer's. Uh, they can be head and neck cancer patients, uh, or they can have systematic diseases as well. Um, there can be some outpatients that are then referred to acute care hospitals for a variety of assessments. That's what we do where, where I work. I work in a variety of skilled nursing facilities, and we will usually refer our patients out to the acute care setting to, to hospitals for assessment, their radiology departments. Um, really, the gold standard of oropharyngeal swallowing function assessment is currently the modified barium swallow study, or the MBSS. This is also referred to as a video fluoroscopic swallow study or a VFSS. Some people also refer to it as a cookie study, um, as, a, as a cookie swallow study. Um, another option is a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing or a FEES. You could say that it provides more information than a bedside, but potentially less information than a modified barium swallow study. Um, it can actually provide more information uh, than a modified barium swallow study with respect to laryngeal function. So for example, you could, you could actually test um, adduction and abduction of the vocal folds much more easily than you could uh, with a fees versus a, a modified barium swallow study. That's not really the purpose of the test. You can also look at, uh, at uh, mucosa uh, integri tissue integrity and the for the presence of, um, of lesions, uh, tumors, abnormal cell growth, that sort of thing. And uh, in the acute care setting, you, you may often make referrals to various other professionals, such as neurologists for further diagnostic workups. So you'd start out with a screening uh, after maybe an initial referral. So this might be a, a 10 to 15 minute bedside swallow screening that you perform that it's just designed to determine whether the patient is exhibiting any signs or symptoms of oral and or pharyngeal dysphagia. You might assess their general level of alertness or cognitive communication skills because the patient must be alert and able to follow simple directions in order to perform various diagnostic procedures, um, including the modified barium swallow study or the fees. Uh, it, they need this as well to perform safe swallowing strategies or perform uh, swallowing maneuvers or exercises. Um, you might also look at the general secretion levels in the mouth, the throat, uh, and in the chest. You might observe their awareness and management of, secretion, of secretions. Uh, do they have anterior spillage of saliva out their mouth? Um, or do they attempt to wipe away drool? Uh, are they clearing their throat or coughing to clear any chest secretions that might be present? What's their vocal quality like? Are they hoarse or is it gurgly or wet? Um, are, are there any obvious reductions in oral motor control? And anything unusually uh, obviously weak or off or discoordinated? You, you will always have to determine their current diet level. Um, are they, you might look at their medical chart. Do they have a history of pneumonia, um, a history of neurologic insult or structural damage or surgery perhaps? Uh, do they have a previous history of dysphagia? Uh, what are their current medical diagnoses? Um, what is their oral hygiene and den dent dental status? Are they a dentalist? Meaning do they not, do they have teeth or not? Uh, are they using dentures?
uh, and you might gather a little bit of information from caregivers, like the families, the SDNAs, or the aides, the nursing staff, and other therapists. And so you use all of this information to determine whether a more in-depth swallowing assessment is warranted. And they might require a modified barium swallow study or a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing um, if you know, the modified barium swallow study is unavailable. And they'll, they'll need this, this more thorough type of assessment to uh, determine the nature of oropharyngeal swallowing deficits. If the patient fails the initial, the initial screening, they will then need an in-depth clinical or bedside examination. So this is where you do a more thorough medical chart review, where you're looking at the, the, the medical diagnoses, the history of recent surgical procedures, trauma, neurologic damage, gastrointestinal complaints, uh, dysphagia. Um, and the reason that you do that is because past issues can be in, indicative for increased risk of future issues. You can kind of predict the future based on the past to some extent. You might also look at history of pneumonia, a history of intubation, um, emergent versus planned. Uh, for example, emergent intubation has more complications uh, relative to, for example, laryngeal trauma than planned intubation. You might look at the timeline of the intubation if there is an intubation present. Um, does, do, do the patients, does the patient have a history of tracheostomy? Uh, and what, what are their current medications? So any other, any other kinds of timeline aspects that uh, can help you determine when the problem started and how it's progressing. Um, what physiologic or anatomical swelling disorders are, are typical of the patient's diagnosis? Uh, oftentimes the patient will have a variety of medical comorbidities that can be influencing the problem. So it's usually not a simple, uh, they have this, therefore they're gonna present as this type of a situation. So usually you, it will be due to a confluence of factors and you'll have to kind of figure out what can be contributing to the problem that you see. You might review relevant neurological, ENT, ear, nose, or, ear, nose and throat physician, uh, gastrointestinal physician, or respiratory uh, consultation reports uh, that are in the chart. Uh, you'll have to review the relevant uh, imaging. So the CT scans, uh, MRIs are present. Uh, look at any previous uh, modified barium swallow study or fees reports that might be in the chart uh, and previous speech therapy reports uh, to see if they've, have they had success with prior therapy? Uh, if so, uh, what, what worked for them previously? Like, as I mentioned before, you always have to determine their current diet level and their restrictions. Uh, what uh, safe swallowing strategies or maneuvers are they currently using, if any? Um, does the patient have a uh, NG tube, a PEG tube, a G tube, a J tube, intravenous feeding, any nutritional supplements? Uh, are, did they have any of these in the past if they don't have them currently? And you might also have to look at uh, things like advanced directives. Does the patient have a living will? Uh, do they have a power of attorney other than themselves? Is somebody else responsible for making medical decisions? If so, you might have to get in touch with that individual to discuss possible uh, assessment and treatment options. Okay, and with the bedside or clinical examination, after the chart review, you're going to look at the appearance and the function of the patient's lips, their oral cavity. You might be looking for secretions or scarring, their tongue, the velopharyngeal region, the pharyngeal walls, the larynx, their awareness of various uh, sensory stimuli. Uh, so looking at the anatomy and the physiology of the patient's oropharyngeal swallowing mechanism. So you might start out with an oromotor assessment and you can see the, uh, the, the previous section on motor speech disorders for uh, more details on oromotor assessment. Generally speaking, you will be looking at the patient's dentition, so their teeth. Are they edentulous? Are they missing a few teeth? Are they missing most of their teeth? Do they have uh, any signs of thrush or poor dental hygiene? You might look at symmetry, tone, steadiness of uh, various uh, structures at rest and during movement. Um, you might look at the strength, the range of motion, the coordination, the speed, the accuracy, the timing of various uh, structures during movement. You might examine non-speech and speech tasks both. Uh, it is important to note that just because the patient has a speech disorder, that may not necessarily be predictive of swallowing disorders, although there might there is a, uh, a, a an association between the two. As I as I showed in, in a previous slide, about twenty percent of patients in a in a previous in a, in a study uh, were found to have comorbid dysarthria and dysphagia. So. You can't say that if a patient has a speech disorder, they are certainly going to have a swallowing disorder. But there might be there there is a, a loose association. 
Uh, you might look at the patient's dry swallowing function. Uh, are they able to swallow dry just without any type of food or liquid in their mouth? You might look at their volitional cough and throat clearing. And your book provides a series of voluntary tasks that you can use during, during a bedside oral motor assessment. So you can look at labial, so the lips, so range of motion, lip spreading, lip rounding, asymmetry, lip set closure, lips on, uh, lip closure on rapid repetition, so pa 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 pa, lip closure during sentence repetition, uh, so lips, tongue, and now you can look at the range of motion, protrusion, elevation, uh, lateralization, retraction, you're looking for asymmetry, uh, rapid repetitive movements as well, uh, contact of the tongue to various structures, including the alveolar ridge. You can look at shaping during speech. You can look at the contact of the back of the tongue with the velum for a variety of speech sounds. You might examine chewing or mastication. You can look at uh, velar function. You can look at the reflex response to touch via a swab. You can look at the cheeks, so the cheek function, uh, tone. And you can look at uh, a laryngeal assessment. So vocal quality on a prolonged vowel, uh, strength of voluntary coughs and throat clearing, repetitive uh, uh, vocalizations. Um, you can do pitch pitch glides, so, so gliding up and down, ma, ma, loudness variations, and you can do a respiratory assessment as well. So the goal of the bedside clinical assessment is to assess swallow physiology without placing the patient at an increased risk of food entering the airway. So as this is the goal, you can assess chewing and lingual control without food. So for example, you might look at the patient's response to a variety of different tastes. Uh, you can look at their ability to lateralize a pseudo bolus, uh, kind of a fake bolus, like for example, a four by four cloth um, and see if they're able to uh, lateralize it, kind of form a cohesive structure with the gauze or the, with the cloth. Um, but that has been moistened with a variety of these tastes. You can look at their ability to masticate, their lingual manipulation or lateralization ability, and see if it becomes stuck on one side. You can examine respiratory support. So, so tasks such as counting the rate of breaths per minute, observing obvious stress, uh, stressful, rapid, or labored breathing patterns. You can have the patient hold their breath for uh, prolonged periods of time uh, and examine signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. You can also assess their ability to use swallowing maneuvers and their coordination of respiration and swallowing. So for example, you, you typically want, want them to swallow during exhalation versus swallowing during inspiration. That tends to facilitate, to, that tends to, to put the patient at a lower risk of aspiration. <clears throat> you might look at uh, their prolonged phonation uh, and observe whether or not there is a wet or gurgly voice quality. Uh, and this also it examines respiratory phonatory control as well. You can look at the presence or absence of a gag reflex uh, to exam and examine the, the pharyngeal wall movement. You might look at the symmetry of the pharyngeal contraction, their laryngeal closure and the elevation of the larynx that occurs during uh, the gag or during a swallow also. Uh, and, and it's of note to, to point out that the absence of a gag reflex may not be predictive of a swallowing disorder. During the bedside clinical assessment, you can also look at the laryngeal function, um, phonatory respiratory coordination. And you might look at adduction exercises, so <coughs> a cough, a <coughs> throat clear, or glottal stops. Ah, ah, ah. Uh, you might look at pitch modulation or glides. Ah, their ability to modulate pitch, their ability to, loud, uh, to modulate loudness. So, uh, Their cognitive communication ability should also be informally assessed throughout the exam. Uh, perhaps you're, you're gonna do this a little bit just throughout as you interact with the patient. And you're looking for things like impulsiveness, the ability to follow directions, uh, just their general awareness, uh, self-monitoring ability, uh, their language level, um, looking for any kind of abnormal behaviors uh, that might be indicative that this patient is a little bit off. Um, they should be able to follow directions in order to be a viable candidate for swallowing therapy. If you observe any deficits relative to cognition or language, you can then uh, perform a cognitive and or language assessment uh, after the, uh, the swallowing uh, assessment is completed.
During the bedside clinical assessment, you will also want to assess PO uh, intake of food. So you're going to want to document all of the following during this uh, assessment. So you're going to want to document what the presentation method was, so spoon or cup or straw, the consistencies presented, and the order of presentation. So you might start with easier consistencies and then graduate to more difficult ones, so perhaps mechanical soft and then regular, or nectar thick liquid and then thin. Of course, this will depend on their, uh, their current uh, diet level, of course. You might observe their awareness of and reactions to food. Uh, do they have a reaction to the food? Um, how, the food placement, uh, look at the mastication time, look at their ability to manipulate the bolus with their tongue. You might look for signs and symptoms of oral apraxia, so any kind of groping or searching motions. You might look for oral stasis or pocketing in the oral cavity, uh, anterior spillage, so due to incomplete lip closure or seal during a during mastication and swallowing. You will want to look for overt signs and symptoms of penetration, perhaps a wet or gurgly voice, or aspiration, cough or throat clearing, perhaps. And again, remember that silent aspiration can occur. So just because the patient doesn't cough, that is not definitive evidence that the patient is not aspirating, right? If there is uh, overt signs and symptoms of uh, aspiration or penetration, what was the consistency or texture of food or drink that they aspirated or penetrated on? Uh, what was the presentation type? Uh, what was the duration of the cough? Was it just a brief, <laughs> a light or tran transient cough or was it a prolonged, <coughs> a long prolonged cough? Um, did it occur immediately or was it delayed? An immediate cough might mean that there was a premature spillage. A delayed cough mean that the, the cough occurred due to pooling and the molecular piriform sinuses that then uh, that then fell into the laryngeal vestibule and at or below the level of vocal folds afterwards, perhaps. Uh, and obviously, you're going to want to keep a record of how many times you see the, the number of signs and symptoms that you observe as well. So how many coughs, how many throat clears, how many wet voice uh, instances. Uh, you can trial some, uh, some safe swallowing strategies uh, or swallowing maneuvers or postures. Uh, you can, of course, also do this during a modified barium swallow study or FEs as well. Um, but you're going to want to do this during the bedside uh, assessment. Note that during the bedside eval, you can't accurately determine the exact physiological abnormality without some type of a more extensive exam, like a modified barium swallow study or FEs. But you can look at the improvement or reduction of signs and symptoms. So are they coughing less when they tuck their chin, for example? And you might prefer out for a modified BRM swallow study or a FEES, then depending on the patient's history, their diagnosis, and the results of the bedside assessment. There are other bedside tests that exist as well. Blue dye test. This is performed in tracheostomized patients. So in this test, you present blue dyed foods and drinks to a patient with a tracheostomy, and then you suction via, through the trach after each swallow to identify the presence of food in the airway below the larynx. So if you see any blue dye that comes out through the, the suction tube, then you make the assumption that aspiration has occurred. There is a, uh, this test is subject to type one and type two errors. So a type one error is a false positive. Uh, type two error is a false negative. So a false positive means that uh, the patient appears to be aspirating when they have not. And a false negative means they, they appear to not be aspirating, but they actually are. So false positive and false negative. Uh, there is no set protocol for a blue dye test. However, typically the presentation order is thin liquids, thick liquids, puree foods, and then mechanical soft foods. And these are of course all dyed blue. And if food is suctioned after a swallow, then you assume that aspiration has occurred and then refer out for a modified barium swallow study. Another bedside test is a cervical auscultation. So this uses a, steth a steth stethoscope against the patient's neck and the sounds of swallowing and respiration are then listened to. This does require training. It's typically performed by doctors and nurses. It can help determine whether a patient is swallowing during inhalation or exhalation. Although if you just watch their chest or belly expand and contract, uh, you can see the timing for yourself without auscultation. You can't determine normal swallowing from auscultation sounds alone, but it can 
give you evidence of inspiratory stridor, wheezing, and crackling. So coarse or fine crackling as well. That might be indicative of some type of pulmonary disease. This is a good video on respiratory auscultation sounds. James, I'm now going to listen to the chest. If you could just take some deep breaths in and out through your mouth. So the modified barium swallow study, MBSS, or video fluoroscopic swallow study, or VFSS. So this identifies abnormal anatomy and specific physiological dysfunctions in oral and pharyngeal stages of swallowing that are causing the signs and symptoms of dysphagia. So this can assess the safety of various diet textures or consistencies and the effectiveness of various swallowing strategies or maneuvers in reducing signs and symptoms of dysphagia. So the goal is to find a way that a patient can eat successfully uh, so PO intake, per oral or intake via mouth. So you need to consider the bolus characteristics that can create systematic changes in normal swallowing. So thinking about the volume and the viscosity of the various foods and drinks presented, you might do a structured approach with two to three swallows each of one, three, five, or 10 milliliters of thin liquid via a cup. That is a more structured approach. You don't have to do that, but that is a possibility. A modified barium swallow study involves presentation of thin liquids, some type of pudding type material, and something that requires mastication like a cookie. Not necessarily in this order, but oftentimes in this order, thin pudding and then something requiring mastication. Obviously, you're going to have to take into account what the patient's current diet is. So for example, if the patient is on a puree diet uh, with nectar thick liquids, you might start with nectar thick liquids and then trial thin liquids, and then you might trial puree, and then you might trial mechanical soft, for example. You might examine the types of stimuli that might uh, improve the patient's swallowing physiology, and the goal is to eliminate aspiration and uh, significant residue. You might use, you might examine postural techniques such as the chin tuck. Postural techniques are oftentimes attempted first because it's relatively easy for most patients to accomplish, and it doesn't really require any extra muscular work. You might look at various methods for heightening sensory awareness, such as bolus volume changes or taste uh, changes, such as a, a sour bolus or, or perhaps a temperature, like a cold bolus. These might uh, improve the speed of oral onset uh, and uh, increase the timing of the pharyngeal trigger, uh, make it quicker, that is. Um, you can look at other swallowing maneuvers and other therapeutic procedures. And you can look at uh, the effect of diet texture changes, such as uh, thicker fluids, increasing fluid viscosity. And you can also look at the effect of combining ver a variety of strategies. And so you could, for example, try chin tuck, you could try head rotation, you could try chin tuck and head rota rotation together. You could try a supra superglottic swallow, a chin tuck plus a head rotation plus a super superglottic swallow. So you can kind of uh, combine these various strategies together just to see what, uh, what combination is optimal, is the safest. Okay, and relative to mo modified barium swallow studies, also known as video fluoroscopic swallow studies, uh, the outcomes are identification of specific anatomical or physiological dysfunctions in the patient's or pharyngeal swallowing mechanism, I identification of the relationship between the patient's physiological dysfunction and their signs and symptoms. So, so that might be, what is the cause of residue or aspiration? Uh, identification of treatment strategies to improve the patient's pharyngeal swallow and the conditions under which the patient can eat safely. Uh, the need for any uh, non-oral supplement or non-oral nutrition. If the patient aspirates and treatment cannot prevent aspiration, then they'll need to be made uh, NPO, nil per oral, so they will not be able to eat by mouth. So. Uh, so supplemental non-oral feeding via a NG tube temporarily or a gastronomy tube, uh, a G tube more uh, for a, a more prolonged period if that is needed. 
uh, the type of swallowing therapy needed to improve the patient's swallowing, and the need for and the timing of reassessment of the patient's oropharyngeal swallowing mechanism. Uh, there is a need for trick uh, transfer of the modified barium swallow study report information from the acute care environment to the long-term care facility. Um, I know from my time in the SNFs that this does not always happen in a timely fashion, and, uh, and the patient doesn't always come to the facility with their modified barium swallow study results. So you might have to call and request this information. Uh, and I should also point out that in not all uh, facilities do a thorough job of performing a modified barium swallow study uh, examination. Some uh, facilities do a, a more thorough job than others. So once you identify the area, uh, the, the facility that does the best job of, mod of uh, performing a modified barium swallow study, whenever you get an opportunity to refer out to that location, I would advise you to do so because you know that they will do a thorough good job. Um, the assessment report uh, might include recommendations for a particular diet or strategies that appear to facilitate uh, safe uh, swallowing. And uh, given a modified diet, like for example, thickened liquids, uh, honey thick or nectar thick liquids, um, uh, one will need to reevaluate to see if the patient is, is able to tolerate a more normal diet. Uh, so reevaluation is critical in patients with non-oral nutrition, especially. Possibly this might look like three to four weeks after the initial evaluation. After a three to four week course of therapy, they might get reevaluated. <clears throat> and uh, relative to the positioning of the patient during the modified barium swallow study exam, there are certain devices that exist for positioning patients that kind of facilitate uh, a range of angles and uh, views. So lateral versus anterior posterior view uh, without the patient having to move, which is uh, very um, convenient. Uh, and so some of these are listed in your textbook here. Um, this might be a bit of a dated list now. Um, it's good to see what is available in your area. Um, in order to perform a modified barium swallow study, one needs adequate competency, adequate, uh, adequate knowledge of normal versus abnormal radiographic anatomy, uh, knowledge of the equipment, how to operate it. Uh, you will not be the one operating it, but it's still good to know just the basic principles of operation, um, knowing the types and volumes of food that might be appropriate for the patient to the presentation type, a straw or cup or sippy cup, the order of presentation that might be the most appropriate, uh, variations in normal swallowing. Are you looking at something that is a normal variation or are you looking at something that's disordered? And how swallowing can change given different bolus characteristics. Um, the anatomy and physiology of swallowing disorders, like what do you typically see in a particular type of swallowing disorder? Uh, options for swallowing therapy that might be appropriate for the patient given a, a, given a particular uh, profile. Um, and the rationale for, their, for these therapeutic modalities use. Uh, and so the skills that you need to complete a modified barium swallow study include positioning of all types of patients for the uh, radiographic assessment, food presentation skills, accurate interpretation, uh, and one source for uh, ac accurate and thorough interpretation of modified barium swallow studies is the uh, modified barium swallow, swallow study impairment profile, the MBS-IMP. Um, and this is a very good resource for training. It's a bit on the expensive side, but it does, uh, it does a very thorough job. Here's the website for the Modified Barium Swallow Impairment Profile. Um, and there is a little information about that. And you can enroll if you wish. And as I said, it is a bit pricey, but it is uh, a, good, um, a good training program. Of course, you'd want a, a knowledge of appropriate uh, intervention strategies based on the patient's disorder, uh, their, their diagnosis, uh, the characteristics of their disorder, um, the ability to evaluate whether or not the strategy was successful, and report writing skills. Okay, here is a normal subject performing a modified barium swallow study. Okay, I just want you to look straight ahead at the wall and say candy, candy, candy. Great, I'm gonna give you the cup. This is a barium liquid. I just want you to take one sip and swallow. Okay. 
Great. Just take a couple sips in a row like you're thirsty. Okay, that's good. All right, I'm going to give you a teaspoon of some pudding. I want you to swallow that when you're ready. I'm going to give you your nuts. Just chew that up and swallow. Enter your okay, I want you to just put your chin up a little bit and say E. Okay, I'm going to give you a, another teaspoon of that pudding. Just look straight ahead when you swallow that. Okay, let me just um, go all the way down. Thanks. You can also see the vocal folds approximate during the modified barium swallow study. So we're looking at the approximation of the vocal folds here and here. E. So true vocal fold, true vocal fold, false vocal fold, false vocal fold. And here is an abnormal adult swallow. Did you see that? Did you see the aspiration? So there was excessive pooling. Some is going down the right way, but some is actually going anteriorly past the level of the vocal folds down into the airway. Oh, okay, there you can see the trace down the anterior portion of the trachea here. Swallow again. Swallow again. Swallow. We have no cough here. You cough for me? Cough for me, Gabe. Cough. What's the bear? What's the bear? Cough for me, Gabe. Cough. <laughs> Still some residue here. So there was still some residue, some pooling in the molecular and piriform sinuses. However, there was no aspiration with the thickened liquids. You can look at these other links on your own. Fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing or fees. So this is a transnasal placement of a fiber optic laryng laryngoscope attached to a camera. Uh, you can visualize the larynx from above. So you can look at the molecula, the piriform sinuses, the vocal folds, the airway, the trachea, a posterior and lateral fringe walls. And you can look at uh, anatomical change changes that might have occurred due to surgery or trauma. Um, the oral stage is not visible as it's uh, anterior of the scope placement, but you can observe the molecula, the uh, piriform sinuses, the laryngeal vestibule, um, that whole region uh, to see if there is any pooling or stasis. Now, the, the trigger, the pharyngeal swallow trigger results in laryngeal elevation and pharyngeal constriction. As a result, this, this creates a whiteout moment as the pharynx closes around the endoscopic tube. So with a fees, the moment of swallow itself is not observed directly. 
So this is one of the major limitations of a fees. You can see this with a modified barium swallow study, but you can't, you can't see the moment of swallowing with the fees. You can only observe just before and just after the swallowing. That being said, you can observe if there's, a, if there's any a remaining food residue or pooling in the molecula or piriform sinuses or even in the vestibule. You know, that would be penetration, of course. Um, you can also use fees for biofeedback. Uh, to examine uh, how effective a patient is at protecting their airway, maybe performing a variety of postures and uh, maneuvers uh, of swallowing with various consistencies and, and see what is the most effective strategy for that particular patient. Uh, it should be noted that you can also use a rigid endoscope as well to, uh, to assess the, the structures in the mucosa, but it's, uh, that this is typically used in a voice assessment. However, uh, they're slightly different. With the, with the flexible endoscope, you can kind of see gross movement better. With a rigid endoscope, you can see the, uh, the movement of the tissue uh, a little bit. You can see that much better with a rigid endoscope via a stroboscopy, which will, that's something we'll discuss in the, the next section on, on the voice and voice disorders. A few fees videos now. Here's a fees video, normal subject. There is some pooling in the molecular here. That's the swallow. Slime the camera a little bit. Oh, another swallow. Of course, we're looking at the molecula here, piriform sinuses there. So that's the right side and the left side. We're looking at the right and left vocal folds, of course. There's a moment of swallow. Pulling the molecular. Pulling in the right piriform sinus, a little bit in the left. No swallow trigger yet. This patient is waiting to swallow. There's the swallow. Slime the camera a little bit. So you might have to have the patient swallow a few times in order to clear the, uh, the mucus off the lens. Yep. There we go. Cooling in the piriform sinuses and molecula. If the bolus were to fall past the area epiglottic folds here into the laryngeal vestibule, that would be penetration. And of course, if uh, the bolus fell past the level of the vocal folds, of course, that would be aspiration. Another swallow. Good close up view of the airway. And here's a fees video of aspiration. You can see, even though it's quite pixelated as an older video, you can see that there is a bolus uh, remnants there below the level of the, past the area epiglottic folds into the laryngeal vestibule. And there was a cough. And gross pooling all around the molecular and piriform sinuses. So aspiration can be inferred from the presence of the residue and the cough. I'll let you look at these other videos on your own. 
So there's a little bit of a difference between doctor's use of endoscopy and speech language pathologist's use of endoscopy. So medical doctors attempt to uncover the underlying causes of abnormal anatomy. So tumor, surgery, trauma, congenital abnormalities, um, abnormal movement, uh, or neurosensory deficits. They want to determine a diagnosis and plan medical or surgical intervention. SLPs, on the other hand, document abnormal and physiological correlates of the underlying medical problem. So we have functional language that we use when we are describing what is going on. We don't talk about diagnosing things ourselves. Doctors diagnose, we assess function. So observations become the basis. Uh, our functional observations then become the basis for decision-making about behavioral management. And we can also trial various techniques such as biofeedback during the exam. Patients with a suspected anatomical or physiological uh, disorder affecting swallowing should have have a medical surgical evaluation prior to consideration of behavioral management, of course. So we're always collaborating with doctors. Endoscopy can be performed by both physicians and SLPs, uh, and the patient can have a joint exam or two separate evaluations. Now, fees versus modified barium small studies. <clears throat> you might choose one or the other due to practical reasons. Maybe the mobility of the patient is an issue. Maybe critically ill patients or intubated patients or patients requiring continuous monitoring. Might, uh, you might find that a fees is safer and easier for them to tolerate, perhaps. Or maybe it's less easy for them to tolerate due to the uh, transnasal endoscope placement, perhaps. Uh, portability might be an issue. Maybe the, uh, since the fees uh, is oftentimes portable, although I should say that there are some uh, modified barium swallow study services that are reasonably portable as well. Um, availability might also differ of fees versus modified barium swallow studies. Uh, so availability is always going to be a factor. Um, if the patient is agitated or confused, uh, perhaps a modified barium swallow study might be a, a better choice uh, given the patient's difficulty in cooperating for the transnasal endoscope placement. Patients with breathy or hoarse voice after an intubation or surgical, after intubation or a surgical procedure, might, uh, it might be better for them to have a fees because you can also evaluate vocal fold function as well. Perhaps aspiration might be due to a, a, a deficit in vocal fold function. Uh, patients with a kind of a globus sensation or a foreign body sensation, something, it feels like there's something stuck in their throat. Uh, they might have um, abnormal esophageal motility or maybe gastroesophageal reflux disease. And so perhaps a modified barium swallow study might be appropriate because then you could pair that with an esophagram. So I should mention here that uh, the fees can visualize mucosa tissue, but it misses the time interval during the swallow itself, as I mentioned before. So it's good because if there's mucosal signs of cancer, potentially, you could exam examine that with the fees. Um, fees, there's no radiation exposure, so that's a positive, but the endo endoscope placement might not be well tolerated. It might be uncomfortable for children and individuals with cognitive communication deficits. Um, the modified barium swallow study, on the other hand, cannot see mucosal tissue, but it can see uh, the airway outline, major structural landmarks, and the entire duration or timing of the swallow. Um, and therefore, it, it also might be more comfortable since there's not a endoscope being placed through the nose, but it does have radiation exposure. So that is a, a, a minus relative to modified barium swallow studies. So your book also provides a number of indications for fees versus fluoroscopic study or modified barium swallow uh, study that are, are useful to, uh, to review. So a little bit more information about fees versus modified barium. Uh, modified barium swallow studies, you can have a coronal or frontal and a sagittal or lateral plane view. Uh, you can look at oral, pharyngeal, and esophageal structures. Viewing time is typically limited to only about three to five minutes uh, due to the risk of radiation exposure. And you get a clearer representation of subglottic aspiration with modified barium swallow studies than you do with fees. Uh, fees, on the other hand, give you a transverse uh, axial or horizontal plane view. You can look at the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the hypopharynx, and the larynx. Uh, the endoscope is, uh, the view of the endoscope is uh, obliterated for about half a second during the swallow itself. Uh, that is, unless the swallow is so weak that the airway is not sufficiently compressed or constricted. And you can have a prolonged view of these structures uh, 
these exams might last 30, 20 to 30 minutes, in fact. Uh, you, it can show the location of the bolus within the hypopharynx and around the larynx uh, more specifically. And you can use it for uh, biofeedback as well, trialing a, a variety of different uh, strategies and maneuvers and, and seeing what works best. So more on the fees. So the fees uh, exam was copyrighted by Langmore, and this is different from the exam perform, performed by otolaryngologists. So otolaryngologists are looking at uh, providing a medical diagnosis, like I said, we are looking at describing function. So all of our language and our diagnosis and our report will be geared towards assessing function. Uh, the fees requires a flexible endoscope, a video camera, a light source, a video recorder, and a monitor. Um, patient comfort is very important during the, uh, the evaluation. Sometimes uh, anesthesia is, local anesthesia is provided uh, to the nose um, to help with this. The exam might last 20 to 30 minutes, actually, so much longer than the modified barium swallow. So you can do more, more things as a result. Uh, some patients might require or request topical anesthesia in the na nasal passages. Uh, that being said, this anesthesia can depress sensation in the larynx or pharynx and can potentially adversely affect the swallowing function, although there's not great evidence of this. Uh, typically, about 0.2 milliliters of about 4% atomized uh, topical lidocaine is used. And this is shown to have very uh, to have no effect on penetration and aspiration scores in dysphagic patients and improved comfort and tolerance. So during the fees, you will uh, assess anatomy and physiology. You will trial a variety of different foods. You might trial some different therapeutic maneuvers and perform a little bit of sensory testing uh, if needed. So relative to anatomy, anatomical and physiological assessments, you're looking at the size, the shape, the symmetry of various pharyngeal and laryngeal structures. Look at presence of secretion pooling, which is a significant predictor of aspiration pneumonia. You might look for suspicious growths or mucosa. Uh, you'll look at the velopharyngeal, the base of tongue, pharyngeal and laryngeal movement. You're looking at range of motion, symmetry of movement, the briskness of the movement, looking, at, uh, looking for adequate glottal closure. Uh, during the swallowing of various food and liquid consistencies that are dyed with green or blue food coloring for optimal viewing, you might look for residue or pooling, spillage into the laryngeal vestibule, uh, laryngeal penetration, uh, aspiration of material below the level of the vocal folds, and you might look at multiple trials for consistency. Obviously, you won't have them aspirate repeatedly. If there is aspiration, you will stop those particular consistencies. Uh, and perhaps try something else um, or perhaps a maneuver. So you can trial therapeutic maneuvers. Um, you might look at, and you're just trying to see what works best. So postural adjustments, what about chin tuck or head turn or rotation, uh, various maneuvers like the supraglottic swallow or Mendelssohn or Masako or the breath hold swallow. Other strategies such as changing the method of delivery, like a straw versus cup versus sippy cup might look at changing the bolus consistency or size or the rate of presentation. And you can also examine the effects of fatigue and uh, providing this, uh, this visual feedback that the patient can look at the screen and see what's going on with their, their larynx, for example. Um, and you might perform sensory testing at the end of the exam right before removing the scope. Um, reduced sensation can cause a loss of bolus control in the mouth, contribute to excess spillage and reduce patient's awareness and response to residue penetration and aspiration. So reduced sensation is always a consideration. And it's good to note that reduced sensory processing can result from a deficit anywhere along uh, the pathways, along the, the sensory pathway, uh, sensory or motor pathways. So it can be at the level of the cortex, the brainstem or the peripheral level, and it can be either a deficit in the sensation or the motor response. So the sensory pathways or the motor response pathways. So your book provides uh, the fees protocol as developed by Susan Langmore in 2004. It gives you a, uh, a nice sequence here to follow. You can examine this at your leisure. So with respect to fees scoring and interpretation, you'll want to note abnormal finding as they, uh, findings as they occur. So premature spillage into the, pure, into the piriform sinuses before the swallow, if there's any residue remaining in the piriform sinuses, uh, any aspiration indications, and that might be a cough or you might actually see a little bit of dye below the level of the vocal folds in the airway. Um, one of the good things about recording these exams is, is that allows for replay. You could actually play it back in slow motion as well. 
um, you might want to comment on the consistency presentation order, uh, maybe various aspects of timing. So you're looking at the various phases, um, effectiveness of bolus clearance, and uh, the patient's response to residue. And the exam ends when the SLP understands the nature of the dysphagia, uh, determines which bolus consistencies, delivery methods, amounts, et cetera, can be swallowed safely and effectively, and notes which interventions facilitate optimal or safest swallowing. So in the fees, there's four major problem types. Uh, so the inability to prepare food orally, inability to initiate swallow in a timing, timely and coordinated manner, uh, inability to adequately protect the airway and or close the velopharyngeal port, uh, and incomplete bolus clearance, uh, so pooling or stasis in uh, the molecular or the uh, piriform sciences. So in order to prepare food orally, one needs adequate tongue and jaw mobility and coordination, some present and aligned teeth or dentures, adequate buccal tension, and adequate alertness and self-monitoring ability. In order to have adequate swallow timing and coordination, you need adequate oral control, lingual and pharyngeal sensation, adequate bolus propulsion, which means that you need adequate lingual and pharyngeal strength timing and coordination, intact uh, an intact swallow trigger reflex, adequate hyolaryngeal elevation and upper esophageal sphincter dilation and cortical monitoring. And you, you, and you might measure pharyngeal delay time. Like how long is the bolus in the pharynx before the swallow actually begins? To have adequate airway protection and or velopharyngeal closure, you're going to need adequate true and false focal hole deduction, adequate arytenoid movement, uh, epiglottic inversion or retroflexion. Uh, and velopharyngeal closure requires adequate strength, range of motion, and timing coordination of the various velopharyngeal muscles. Complete bolus clearance requires adequate base of tongue and pharyngeal strength, range of motion, and coordination, and a lack of uh, any, anything obstructing the bolus path. I should mention that it's difficult to determine the exact cause of stasis or pooling from endoscopy, but the location of residue may provide clues. So for example, if residue is left on the base of tongue, then you can assume that there's insufficient squeezing of this region against the posterior pharyngeal wall. If, however, there's residue in the hypopharynx region, maybe around the piriform sinuses, then maybe uh, kind of closer to the UES, then maybe there's incomplete to UES opening. Uh, and some of these correspondences, with these, these relationships between the location of residue and the source of the problem have been supported by simultaneous pharyngeal uh, manometry and fluoroscopic studies. So risks associated with video endoscopy, there are negligible risks for, for fees, provided that, that the clinician has received adequate training uh, and that no topical anesthetic has been applied. There have been no reported incidents of major problems as a consequence of performing a fees exam after more than 15 years of use by thousands of clinicians. That being said, some of the minor common problems that do exist include uh, minor patient discomfort, uh, cough or gag response is pretty common. And this can be minimized with appropriate technique and or use of a pediatric endoscope. So an endoscope with a smaller diameter. There are some complications that are associated with the use of topical anesthesia. Uh, lidocaine is a common one. That's one of the best ones or possibly nasal decongestant. And these include a small risk of allergic reactions. Uh, so to mitigate this, medical clearance should be obtained prior to the use of of these anesthetics and or you should be restricted to institutions that provide medical support. And you should only use a small amount of anesthetic when you are using it. Uh, there's, a, my, there's a risk of nosebleed. So your technique should ensure that there's minimal contact pressure between the endoscope tube and the nasal mucosa. And if there's any kind of resistance that you encounter, do not force anything. Also pay attention to patient feedback. There is a risk of what's referred to as a vasovagal response or fainting during the procedure. This usually occurs due to anxiety and it's typically preventable given careful patient monitoring and conveying an air of calm reassurance to the patient. If this does occur, uh, you will want to position the patient at supine with their head above their feet and possibly provide smelling salts if available. Uh, vasovagal response can be dangerous in patients with acute cardiac conditions, bradycardia or cardiac dysrhythmia. So you can monitor 
the uh, heart rate in these patients with, uh, the, with the assistance of uh, doctors and nurses, and you'll want to terminate the exam given increased uh, heart rate in these patients. Other common problems uh, associated with fees include laryngospas laryngospasm. There is minimal risk of this. Uh, it has never been reported so long as the endoscope remains in the vocal folds. Uh, you'll want to avoid contact between the endoscope and the true vocal folds. Laryngospasm can occur in some patients with bilateral upper motor neuron damage like ALS, given uh, aspiration of their own secretions or placement of strong or pungent odor food placed in their mouth. If this does occur, any, if laryngospasm does occur, you're going to want to withdraw the endoscope, use patient relaxation te techniques, uh, and if that fails, if the laryngospasm continues, an option is Heimlich maneuver or uh, supplemental O2, uh, which can also break the spasm. And, and this will be, and obviously a, a doctor or a nurse will be present in the room to, to, to uh, facilitate this. Aspiration is another risk. If the patient has not been eating by mouth for a prolonged period of time, or if severe dysphagia is suspected, then you're going to want to perform oral care and then try ice chips as the first bolus trial consistency. Uh, and given success, uh, a successful swallowing of ice chips, then you'll progress to more advanced diet texture trials. And it, it is important to note that risks associated with fees are unlikely, but the risks are much less serious than that of aspiration, of a chronic aspiration, which will likely continue without meaningful assessment and intervention of the dysphagia. With fees, there is a risk of transmission of infectious disease. And therefore, you must clean the endoscope thoroughly between exams. According to the guidelines of the instrument manufacturer and professional medical associations, um, and use universal precautions. And it's, it's good to stay current with the latest recommendations as these do, uh, as these may change over time. So in terms of selecting instrumental diagnostic procedure, you could use fees uh, if you suspect if, if it is available and modified barium swallow is, swallowing study is not. Um, if there are, are concerns of any anatomical or uh, abnormalities, such as cancer, trauma, surgery, damage to the mucosa. And if you want to answer questions about the function of the epiglottis or of the vocal folds. Uh, modified barium swallow study is, of course, the current gold standard of swallowing assessment. So if that's available, that is the first choice. Um, you can also use other techniques, such as pharyngeal manometry, which uh, gives information about pressure generation during the swallow at various locations in the, in the pharynx. You can also use ultrasound to get a detailed visualization of tongue movements and provide patients biofeedback as well. So there are a variety of sensory enhancement and postural strategies that are available that your book provides. So sensory enhancement procedures include increasing bolus size, bolus viscosity or thickness, changing bolus taste, uh, increasing the pressure of the spoon on the tongue, thermal tactile stimulation, uh, suck swallow, chewing, and uh, self-feeding. I should mention that there is some research that suggests that uh, sour boluses, uh, cold boluses, and spicy boluses uh, decrease the latency of the swallow reflex trigger. So basically a, a sour, a cold, and a spicy bolus may result in a, and or a spicy bolus may result in a faster uh, trigger. So postural strategies are also provided. So uh, there's the chin up uh, uh, posture, which might help use gravity to kind of clear the oral cavity from the bolus. Um, the gentleman that I'm currently working with, uh, who, who is a diagnosis of progressive bulbar palsy, that's the, uh, the, rain, the first rainbow passage example in the motor speech disorders um, uh, slides, he uses this strategy to clear his oral cavity uh, because he has inability to elevate and lateralize his tongue, for example. So he has to use this chin up, chin up strategy in order to clear his oral cavity uh, during swallowing. Uh, chin down uh, actually widens the vellicula to, to pre prevent bolus, the bolus entering the airway. Um, the gentleman with progressive bulbar palsy that I'm working with does this after, uh, after he does the chin up. He actually does a chin up, breath hold, chin down, hard, hard effortful swallow, and then a second swallow in order to clear the bolus, for example. Um, so you can actually pair a number of these postural strategies with maneuvers uh, in order to get a, a optimal result for your particular patient. Um, 
right? A chin down strategy. You can also have a, a, a position where the head is rotated to the, da the damaged side. And this might improve focal fold closure uh, on that particular side by applying extrinsic pressure. And this also might eliminate that uh, piriform sinus channel on that damaged side. It kind of squeezes it so that's eliminated. Uh, you can head tilt to the stronger side so that due to gravity, the bolus wants to go down the side that is lower, uh, that, that piriform sinus channel that is lower. I should also note that head rotation also tends to pull the cricoid cartilage away from the posterior pharyngeal wall. So this might reduce pressure in the cricopharyngeal sphincter. So if there is a cricopharyngeal or a UES dysfunction, uh, head rotation might assist with that as well. So here's kind of a summary of some various uh, dysphagia treatment strategies. So there's diet textural modifications. So we have, you know, thin liquids, nectar thick liquids, honey thick liquids, so a variety of viscosities of fluid. And there's regular mechanical soft and puree textures relative to solids. And those are the national dysphagia diet level uh, levels. It should also be noted that there are the IDSI diet levels as well, a newer um, categorization of diet levels. And it has more gradations. It has more of them. And I'll show you, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about conversion between uh, national dysphagia diet and IDSI uh, in a bit here. Uh, it should be noted that diet texture modifications should be used as a last resort, ideally. Use of postural adjustments and swallowing maneuvers do require intact cognition. So in order for a patient to do a, a chin tuck or a head turn or a supraglottic swallow, for example, they have to have the ability to follow directions. And so if they're not cognitively intact, perhaps that you have to use diet textural modifications because there are no other options. Um, postural adjustments are, are an option if cognition is intact. So sitting up at approximating 90 degrees, a chin tuck, a head turn, to the weak side or a head tilt to the, the strong side, a head back. Um, as we discussed, a variety of swallowing maneuvers, a masako, in which you stick your tongue out and lightly hold the tongue between the teeth and then swallow. That pulls the posterior pharyngeal wall uh, more anteriorly towards the base of tongue. Um, Mendelssohn maneuver, where you swallow and hold the larynx up. A superglottic swallow, a super superglottic swallow, effortful swallow and other behavioral strategies. So multiple swallows per bite. So maybe double swallow or triple swallow. Uh, alternation of solids and liquids or sometimes referred to as a liquid wash technique. Um, if there's, especially with dry foods, um, patients oftentimes have reduced salivary uh, productivity in their salivary glands. So their, their mouths are often dry uh, with age and also they might be on drying medications. So if you put a dry food in a patient's mouth that is also dry, things will likely stick. And so alternating solids and liquids tend to, tends to flush things down a little bit more easy, more easily. Um, bolus size modifications might be uh, advised. So a smaller bolus, if the patient is, uh, is aspirating or has signs or symptoms of aspirating on, on moderate to larger size boluses, uh, you can use rate modifications. So slowing down, maybe using one bite at a time. A variety of oropharyngeal swallowing exercises. So chin tuck against resistance or CTAR. Uh, the Shakir exercises, lingual, labial, masseter, uh, range of motion coordination and strength exercises. So here are a few swallowing maneuvers. So the superglottic swallow, the super superglottic swallow, and the effortful swallow and the Mendelssohn maneuver provided by your book. Okay, here are my directions for swallowing maneuvers. So superglottic swallow, inhale, hold your breath early, swallow, and then immediately cough or throat clear. So, <clears throat> or... <coughs> superglottic swallow, and then super superglottic swallow. It's the same as above, only you bear down. <sighs> that's like, that's bearing down. Bearing, bearing down is basically holding your breath and then squeezing your abdominal muscles. That's basically bearing down. And you can facilitate this by pushing down on a desk or pulling or uh, maybe pulling up uh, upwards, uh, possibly holding the bottom of your chair and pulling up on both sides. These might help with bearing down. Um, effortful swallow is basically just swallowing hard. Um, Mendelssohn maneuver, you swallow and you hold your larynx up. Um, and then Masako is you stick your tongue straight out and swallow. So I will actually demonstrate these. So here is the uh, Mendelssohn. So watch my larynx, here's my thyroid lamina. Did you see how I held it up? 
That is Mendelssohn. And Masako is where you stick your tongue out, hold it lightly between your teeth, and then you swallow. Took a little bit because my mouth was, because my, my throat's a little dry. But swallowing with your tongue out, that pulls that posterior pharyngeal wall anteriorly towards the base of tongue. Okay, so swallowing therapy is designed to change the physiology of the patient's swallow. So this can include muscle exercises directed at the specific locus of the patient's physiologic abnormality. So this can be indirect, therapy can be indirect or direct. So indirect therapy is exercising muscle groups used in swallowing or practicing neuromuscular elements of swallowing without actually using food. This reduces the risk of aspiration. So you might do these in patients that are severely dysphagic or possibly uh, they have NPO status. So things such as effortful breath hold without swallowing or effortful breath hold with swallowing and a variety of lingual, labial, and pharyngeal uh, strengthening exercises. Um, exercises can be done independently or with the help of family and caregivers outside of scheduled therapy sessions. And this gives them plenty of opportunities to practice uh, with the people that are going to be there in their lives all the time. So it just basically gives them a greater amount of practice. A direct therapy is, on the other hand, is designed to change swallowing physiology and procedures are practiced using food and or liquid. Direct swallowing therapy is generally not provided if the patient is aspirating, if they're severely dysphagic. Uh, dysphagic. Um, and this might include swallowing maneuvers such as supraglottic swallows, uh, super supraglottic swallows, effortful swallows, Mendelssohn maneuver, Masako, uh, trialed with food. Um, and this requires the ability to file, follow directions and a minimal level of muscular work and fatigue resistance. Uh, with direct therapy, uh, the most effective, the easiest, and the lowest effort option is typically best. Your book provides a few goals and, instruction, and instructions for therapy procedures that can be practiced indirectly. So range of motion exercises for various articulators, adduction exercises, base of tongue retraction, masako maneuver, effortful swallow, uh, chewing on gauze, uh, bolus control exercises, uh, the use of falsetto, this kind of voice, thermal tactile stimulation, a suck swallow, easy breath hold, and effortful breath hold. So a little bit about uh, the Shakir and the, the sitar exercises. Shakir exercises improve elevation of the hyolaryngeal complex during swallow and uh, increase the width of uh, upper esophageal sphincter opening. And they're designed to strengthen the cervical muscles that pull up on the hyoid and the larynx and open the UBS. Patients lie on their back, uh, they elevate their head just enough to see their feet or their toes while keeping their shoulders on the bed. And you can do this isometrically or isotonically. Uh, the chin tuck against resistance or sitar exercise is similar to the Shakir, and it improves elevation of the hyaluryngeal complex and the UES opening, just like Shakir. It's performed seated, and the patient puts a compressible object like an inflatable ball or a stress ball, a towel, a pillow, etc., under their chin, and then they then tuck their chin towards the manubrium sterni while squeezing the ball. And you can do this isometrically or isotonically. It might be less strenuous than the Shakir due to the supine posture of the, of the, of the Shakir. And there's some evidence that uh, indicates that CTAR facilitates greater, greater uh, surface EMG values, so greater muscle contraction. Note about evidence-based practice. So evidence-based based practice refers to uh, utilizing current best research evidence the clinician's experience, critical thinking, and pathophysiological knowledge, and the patient's preferences in combination to find the best treatment approach. First, you define the patient problem. You proficiently search and critically appraise relevant in information from the literature. And then you decide whether or, or how to use this information in practice to design a patient's treatment plan. And so relative to searching literature, it's good to know which evaluation or therapy procedures have little, limited, or no evidence, and then exercise caution if you decide to use them. For example, um, e-stim, vital stimulation, myofacial release, these have uh, limited uh, evidence. You should say that uh, it's important to note that third-party payers may reject a claim, uh, an insurance claim, if therapy is not evidence-based. 
if you still decide, decide to use a non-evidence-based procedure, it's your responsibility co to collect and document data to demonstrate the effectiveness of the procedure for that particular patient. Relative to uh, evidence, to levels of evidence, the Oxford level of evidence scale is provided here. So it gives you kind of an idea of what the highest level of evidence is and the lowest level of evidence. So just for, uh, so note that a meta-analysis or a systematic review of two or more highly high quality randomized controlled trials showing similar direction and magnitude of results is number one, A here. And the lowest level of evidence is expert opinion. Your book also provides a variety of measures of swallowing that are useful clinicians when trying to determine the efficacy of a treatment. So a note about the use of water in screening or treatment. So this involves the dysphagic patient swallowing measured amounts of water un uninterrupted until the water has been completely cleared. So for example, the three ounce water swallow test. A negative response is the patient interrupting the repeated swallows to breathe, cough, or an instance of choking while drinking and the inability to swallow the entire measured volume in consecutive repeated swallows. Failure then results to a referral for an instrumental swallowing assessment. Note that if the patient is severely dysphagic, uh, dysphagic, this screening procedure could result in aspiration of a large volume of water and rarely but possibly respiratory arrest. Therefore, this procedure is not recommended for screening for swallowing disorders due to the unnecessary risk that it involves. And it's an obvious statement, but management of dysphagia should not increase the patient's risk. Uh, also relevant to, to use of water is the Fraser free water protocol. So it operates under the principle that using sterile water is safe as a small amount of sterile water can be resorbed back into the lung tissue. However, bacteria can be introduced into the airway via the patient's mouth. So sterile water is no longer sterile once it touches the patient's mouth. So the bacteria can be present in the food or the drink itself or due to transfer from the patient's mouth down to the lungs. So if thorough meticulous oral care is done prior to water trials, then this can mitigate the risk of bacterial infiltration via the mouth during PO intake of sterile water. So this is the principle behind the Fraser free water protocol. The, the patients at mild risk versus moderate or severe risk for aspiration on thin liquids, they are freely allowed water so long as they or the caregiver perform thorough oral care prior to the trials and, and provided that they only drink water. So there's no alternation of food and drinks. There is some evidence that this protocol increases PO intake of fluids, increases patient quality of life, and does not increase the risk of lung complications. As a general rule though, exercise caution in using water in management of dysphagic patients. Understanding and being able to explain the physiologic rationale for each procedure that you use to the patient's attending physician, other healthcare professionals, the patients and caregivers, and the patient themselves is highly important. So a little bit about diet mod modification. So first the national dysphagia diet. Um, and with respect to solids, the patient will be either NPO, so nothing by mouth, non, nil, nil pair oral, so nothing by mouth, uh, pureed solids, uh, mechanical soft solids, or regular solids. With respect to liquids, they are either NPO, on honey thick liquids, on nectar thick liquids, or on thin liquids. And the descriptions are there for your review. I've also provided a link to a informative YouTube video on the National Dysphagia Diet. There is a newer diet called the IDSI or International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, um, which breaks down uh, solids and liquids along this con continuum. So a regular, soft and bite-sized, minced and moist, pureed, liquidized, or moderately thick, uh, mildly thick, slightly thick, and thin. And here is the IDSI uh, framework website provided. And it gives you a very detailed uh, framework and detailed de definitions, testing methods, and evidence statements. So check those out at your leisure. And here's comparing the National Dysphagia Diet, diet versus IDSI. So there is a conversion. So regular uh, NDD is regular IDSI. Uh, dysphagia, uh, mechanically soft, um, advanced, or chopped is equivalent to soft and bite-sized. 
Dysphagia mechanically altered or ground is equivalent to minced, minced and moist. Dysphagia pureed is the same as pureed. And then thin liquid is thin. Slightly thick does not exist in national dysphagia diet. Uh, mildly thick is the same as nectar thick. Moderately thick is the same as honey thick. And extremely thick is the same as pudding thick. Okay, and that concludes the, uh, the, the section on dysphagia. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one.